seated. All right, Mr. Clegg, you may uh, continue the CD. Thank you, sir. And exactly where it's at. Don't start it over. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Sir. Thank you. Sign contacts and um, <coughs> sign information.
somehow Rusty was, you know, telling these other employees something. And Rusty always said, don't stop coming to me. I can't do anything. They are who they are. You know, he was very just nonchalant about it. I'm assuming that this is why they was talking to you. something. 
Dorothy's path, past, that you could imagine could want to do this to Rusty. Not even if it's not, even if that per you can't imagine the person doing it himself, but hiring somebody to do it. Because I mean, if, if, if I realize it was more recent, um, he had a lot of wealthy clients. Somebody with that kind of money, if he knew that at any point, I understand, could, you know, but Rusty had the best relationship with all of these wealthy people that he's worked with, really.
technology whiz and whatever, right? And then Harold recommended Mike to be part of this company. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so, um, it was, um,
question is that the, the mornings were a very routine every day, yes. the same thing happened. Yes. And you could always expect Rusty to be at the daycare center yes. between, 8, 5, between 8.45 and 9 a.m. Yeah, somewhere in the 8.30 to 9.15 range, really. Yes, that's, you can guarantee he's going to be there. Yeah. It depends on right. what you yeah. Who else would know his routine for the mornings? We do. We have breakfast with them on Skype. We do. We do. They know when they're leaving the door. So nobody outside the family, his business partner, as far as you know, I know you can't be 100% positive. No. Neil, business partner. Neil will be the only guy. Yeah, the only, only, only reason Neil will know is that Neil knows not to make meetings before the time that Rusty has to drop. Well, Rusty yeah. sounds like the type when he bragged that he's taking his kids to school in the morning every day. That's important to him, so that's what he gets up to do the first thing. So if he talks about his kids, he's going to say, you know, I, there, are, there are some men that take a lot of pride in the fact they're home, go to school, pick the kids up, take, bring them to school. So, yeah. And that's what we're getting at. I mean, oh, does he, does he tell that? But, yeah, I mean, does he, does he brag? You know, I don't want to say brag, but boast about something like that. Where, no. Not no, boast, yeah, but not, not boast. It's not, it's not finding the right word, but I mean, no. he's proud of the he fact that he has So in general conversation, that's what I'm saying. No. Yeah. No. It's probably the fact that he's able to do it. One minute, this neighbor from down the block, the lady I talked to, I never heard of her. She said her name was yes. the news. She said she did have not talked to you and she brought it over. And she asked me if we were having a wake and I said, no, we're just sitting here. She <laughs> said, she's not going to do it. Do you know her? I, she came out of nowhere from the neighbor. The neighbor's coming from out of nowhere. No, he doesn't tell anyone that he takes his kids to school outside of this family necessarily. Um, but remember, he doesn't have a traditional job, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like there's a group of people he's going to that knows that he that will answer that. Um, do you know what I'm saying? Um, so by the way, this this is my Baco exterminating guy. His name is Lou. I don't know his last name. Uh, he called this morning. Well, just listen a minute. Yeah, sorry. He comes into my house frequently. Mm -hmm. Sprays for bugs. I mean, I love him. He's actually great. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you that he knows our schedule. Okay. Okay? And he has been here at 7 a.m. We like to spray the house right before we leave because I'm sort of paranoid about the smell of the bug spray and the kids' toxic blah. Which I'm sure is crap, but I'm just telling you that I mean I I can't. He somebody else that knows this guy. He 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 knows. He's very familiar with our house. He's very familiar with our cars. I don't think he actually knows where we go to school. Like I don't think he knows where. Um, but I'm just telling you that. Um, what? Oh,
first part. It's our cards, you know, he knows that first part of our day. He was he was here and it probably was Thursday at the honestly don't know. Okay. Could have been Wednesday, could have been Thursday, I'm not sure. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember that before. It's okay. But it's but he has called, so he That's probably cool. knows something. Okay. Um, um is there she's got no search you can tell. Yeah. You are continuing? Yeah. You want to continue? To How much more? So it depends on her. I think she's doing pretty great. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. As long as she's strong for it, I'll stay. Okay. How's that? Pardon? Do you know anybody that drives a silver minivan? Whether it's a nanny at somebody else's um, house or... No, I mean, they do have a silver Besides. I mean, this is family members, mm -hmm. right? Uh, anybody, just anybody. Yeah, yeah but he, he so has a silver, silver Odyssey.
conducted herself for Bonnie Ford in it. She's extremely professional. This is Rusty's plan. So I just need for you to know that as soon as that happened, she shared, she shared that with me. Not more words, she said, I made it very clear to him that I was interested in him, and that this wasn't going to go anywhere. And you, you knew that was. I, I knew she was. Yes. I thought she talked to me. Yeah. We're close. And, and she said, I can handle it. I said, what are you going to do? Should you go to someone in HR? Who do you talk to right. about sexual harassment? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, I can I can be with you. Sure. I, I can, I, I make, I'm making it clear to you that this will mm -hmm. never, nothing is going to happen. Mm -hmm.
to your husband. That information can get tossed out and the whole case can just be, can be dismissed and the guy will never serve time. That's how violent this computer is. I completely understand wanting to get all the personal pictures, all the account information, everything like that off of the computer so you can maintain your family pictures, maintain your memories, maintain, uh, move on with your, with your business and paying the bills and all that. I completely understand that. But by doing that, you, you are jeopardizing the possibility of having legitimate information in there being tossed out in court by a savvy defense attorney. Well, we already attempted to copy the photos. It didn't work. It didn't work. Okay. Okay, what I'm going to need from you guys, I, I, I have, I, I don't want, I hate doing this. I need a statement from you guys saying that we attempted to copy photos for this reason on this day. Okay. What what we need to do is I need to take this computer to a forensic computer specialist. It's either going to be the GBI or the DeKalb District Attorney's Office. Once they take a photo of that hard drive, which shows everything the way it is once it comes into our possession, and I get that statement from you guys, that should cover it. And once once we get that once we get that image from the forensics, then we can. We can download anything that you guys need to move on with this. Okay, but it's important that it happens with a state certified forensic specialist to log in and verify everything first before we go in and start manipulating files in any kind of fashion. Okay. I'm just telling you, we've already tried to take off the photos and the bank account information. I needed that. Right.
write down the statement as to the day and the time that you guys tried to do stuff on the computer. I can bring over to you, or you can come over to the police department um, and write down on the official paperwork, this is what I did, this is when I did it, and hopefully that'll be enough. Okay? Now, Thank you. 
he got Chinese as a cousin's business card. So he, he printed that a lot. This is the card of sale. Files. We're, we're going to need that too. We want it done. We're going to have, we're not examined. We're going to have financial people examined. We're going to have some of our own things and stuff. What is the procedure for keeping a log on what's taken in? Yeah, we've got to have a log. And so we can get copies of that log. Are you going to get a copy and, before we leave the house? And,
I don't have the um, the crime scene tech, the, the two the two crime scene technicians that were out at the car. I don't have their report yet. They're, they document everything that was at the scene. I do not have the medical examiner's report yet. They document everything that was with Rusty when they got it. I'm going to get the report. Rusty was transported to the hospital before we got it. So we, we don't have control. What we're going to do is contact the hospital to the medical examiner. murder cases had you investigated prior to this case, sir? This is our, my first homicide. And uh, we have listened to a reasonably lengthy tape here. Um, you were the one who was focusing on particular areas to ask questions about, were you not? Yes, I was trying to get as much information as possible to try to figure out where I need to go with the investigation. You were the one who was asking about Rusty's business Relations, correct? Yes, that was one of the areas I needed to know about. And you asked extensive questions about those, correct? Asked what? Extensive questions about Since Rusty's business transactions and relations, correct? Yes, as, they, as Andrew was giving me information, other questions were coming up for her to clarify or to add on to or to further explain. Okay. Uh, and you were the one who wanted to know the specifics about what, what Rusty, who he associated with, who he had worked for, um, whether he had made enemies along the way, you name it, correct? Yes, because I didn't have any inf information about anybody in the family at the time, and as far as I knew at that point in time, Rusty was a perfect guy. He had no enemies. I had to ask everything to try to find a focus for my investigation. Okay. Uh, during the course of your investigation, you found absolutely nothing to suggest that Rusty wasn't a perfect guy, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, at one point, you made a comment about crafty defense attorneys and how they will come into court and paint a uh, negative picture of the victim, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, let me ask you this, sir. 
At some point during the course of the interview, did Mrs. Snyderman say to you, I appreciate your asking these questions about Rusty's business transactions and dealings, but I think you're barking up the wrong tree. Yes, she did say that. She basically attempted to suggest to you that whatever business dealings Rusty had had with this individual or that individual, it was unlikely that it would result in someone wanting to kill him, correct? That was her opinion, however, a spouse or any family member never knows exactly what's going on in a person's life unless they're with them 24 hours a day. So I had to c pursue with those questions to get as much information and through the course of investigation, I would determine if it was relevant or not. So you were the one who obviously was going to determine where the investigation went, correct? That's correct. Okay. And it, at the time when you interviewed Mrs. Snyderman, on November the 19th of 2010, you wanted to focus on what was going on in Rusty Snyderman's life when he wasn't with his wife Andrea, correct? I was not focusing on anything in, sp very, uh, in particular, I was focusing on everything. It was a fishing expedition to get as much information as possible. And uh, that was, in fact, you were the one running the fishing expedition, correct? That's correct. Now, at some point you asked, um, did you do a little too much talking during the course of this interview? I, when we actually got into the actual questions and everything, no, I don't believe I did. I let her talk. At the beginning of the interview, do you think you did a little too much talking? At the beginning of the interview, I did a lot of talking. However, I was also trying to establish a rapport with the family so they could start to trust me and be able to answer the questions without any fear of answering questions or be able just to relax around me and for me to get to know the family and to explain everything because it's a lot of people do not have direct experience with court with crimes with the criminal law in general when it comes to a situation like this i want the victim or the victim's family to be aware of what the process is, what we do, and this is what's going to happen. That can be a little lengthy at times, but I try to get that away at the very beginning so we're all on the same page, and then I go into the questioning and let the person talk. And at the conclusion of the interview, you spoke at length about why it is that the police needed the computer, correct? That's correct. And you also spoke about how long it was that the computer could be actually kept from the family, correct? That's correct. They were starting to put up a little resistance in giving us the computers that we were there to see, saying, can we come back tomorrow? And so I felt, because of their lack of knowledge of the criminal process, I need to explain to them it in fairly decent depth as to why we need the computer. Well, you heard the audio. I had to go into specific... I felt like I had to explain to them to keep the peace and for them to understand and to have the cooperation without having to force anything. Okay. Most of the questions that you posed focused on Rusty's interactions with other people, correct? That was part of the questioning, correct. Virtually all of the questions that you asked focused on Rusty's interactions with other people, correct? Correct, because I needed to get to know who Rusty was. Okay. But the only really question that focused on Andrea Snyderman was when you asked her whether anybody had showed, tried to break up her marriage or shown interest in her, correct? Correct. At this point, at that point in time during the questioning, I had no reason, I didn't sus know who to suspect and what was going on. Because Rusty was the victim, there's a better chance that somebody in Rusty's life that had a beef against him for whatever the reason was and not necessarily in Andrea's life. So I'm trying to get to know Rusty as best as possible because I can't talk to him anymore. Okay. Is it fair to say that the focus during the course of the interview was to get to know about as much as you could about Rusty and not necessarily about Andrea? For that day, yes. I was more interested in getting to know more specifics about Andrea when we could talk one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Does that explain why it is when the subject was brought up of Hemi Newman that you had virtually no follow-up questions? No. When she brought up Hemi Newman, she minimized the importance of the, uh, the affair that she neglected to tell me about you during that interview. You are assuming, sir. She had a mouth. 
Okay, I well, I'm going to object to his answer, Your Honor. Well, you're going to make an objection, make an objection, but don't cut okay, it. I'm going What's the to objection? Object. He is offering his opinion as to the nature of the relationship between the parties. I do not think that is appropriate. He is not qualified nor competent to do so. What's the state's position? Your Honor, I object to counsel objecting to an answer that he got to a fair question that was asked of the witness. Right, I'm going to overrule your objection, Mr. Clay. Answer the question if you can. Yes, sir. Could you ask the question again? I don't remember, <laughs> I don't remember what it was. <laughs> the, 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 when it came to the, when um, the response I was about asking when, whether you had asked Hemi. Andrea any follow-up questions. With the Hemi, regarding yes. Hemi, correct. She minimized how important Hemi was in her life. She did not tell me about any of the interactions during the business trip, she did not tell me about any extramarital affairs. All she did was say that he made a pass, she said no, he clearly understood, and that was it. There was no, nothing else for me to follow up. I was like, okay. At that time, that was a little blip. She, he said something, they got over it, they moved on. Okay. So you brought the subject up about whether or not somebody else was interested in her, correct? That's correct. And she immediately, instantaneously, gave you the name of Hemi Newman, correct? That's correct. She said her boss, correct? Correct. She then said Hemi, correct? Correct. She then supplied the last name, correct? And spelled it. And then you asked for the age of this individual, right? I did. Was she able to give you his age? She said 46, I'm not sure, late for, uh, mid to late 40s, I believe, something along those lines. At some point, did you make a determination as to the actual age of Hemi Newman at that time, sir? On that day, no. No, not on that day. At some point during the course of the investigation in the year 2010. Yes, when he became the focus of the investigation. Okay. Um, what is the next defense exhibit? Is it number 22? Okay. 23, okay. It could be 23, 22 was the consent search. search. Consent and search document. Yes, sir. Um, D23, that's where we are. Okay, thank you, sir. You're quite welcome. May I approach on? Yes, sir, you may. Sir, I'm going to show you a document marked as Defendant's Exhibit Number 23 and ask if you recognize what Defendant's Exhibit Number 23 is. This is, looks like a TLO report. Um, I'm sorry, what type is of it's called? TLO. It's the initials true? actually stand for the last one. I don't know the last one. That's right. just what the maker of the program decided to name it. And what the program does, you put in a little bit of information, um, name, date of birth, or state, and a name, something like that. And it pulls up as much information that's out there that's public to try to find an address, a phone number date of birth, driver's license information, things like and that. And does that relate specifically to Hemi Newman? Yes, the name Hemi, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Z-V-I Newman. Okay. And was name. that done by the Dunwoody Police Department, that request, sir? It looks like one of our, it looks like a printout from our program and it does not say Dunwoody Police Department on it. Okay. Um, does that reflect the age of Mr. Newman as of We're no... Not going to object to counsel getting into the content of the document unless and until he I'm going to sustain that objection. Go ahead. Okay. I would move to tender that exhibit into evidence. Any right? objection? I object. I don't believe he's laid a proper foundation, Your Honor. I'm going to sustain that objection. You're on okay. that foundation for that exhibit. At some point, did you determine the age of Hemi Newman, sir? Uh, through the report of that it provided his date of birth. Okay. And what was his age as of November 18th or November 19th of 2010, sir? Well, sir, was born uh, December. Again, I'm going to object. Well, now, his question didn't require him to read that document. He asked him what was his age, so well, I don't know why he's reading that document. If you want him to remove it, I tell him to remove it, but he's, he's looking at a document that has, it's not in, but the question did not call for him to read that document. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, may we remove the document unless and until it's tendered? Well, I'm not going to. Okay. Just put it down. <laughs> ask him a question. All right. As of November the 19th of 2010, how old was Hemi Newman? No, 48. 48? I believe so. Have to no, <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to do the math for it. Okay. 
<laughs> He's asking you a question. Yeah, I believe it's. Why are you looking at this? Yes. If you don't know, you know, it's okay to say, I don't know. Yes, sir. <laughs> doing, the, the, doing the quick math, it says 48. I believe he was 48 years old. I'm sorry? 48, I believe. 48, okay. <clears throat> Certainly not 46, correct? No, 48's not 46, that's correct. And um, now let me ask you this, sir. Um, the, in regards to the follow-up questions, do you ask whether there was any sort of email communication between Andrea Snyderman and Hemi Newman? No, I did not. Did you ask whether there was phone communication between Hemi Newman and Andrea Snyderman? No, I did not, because she did not give me any reason to ask those questions, because uh, that, was, that was it that day. Nothing more. She didn't give me any further information to be any, to be suspicious for that there was any further communication regarding anything after that one moment. Had any of Andrea Snyderman's phone records been subpoenaed on November the 18th of 2010, sir? At some point, her phone her phone records were subpoenaed. Was well, that? Did you hear his question? He said on November the 18th. That's what he asked. You. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it was on November the 18th or not. Did you hear his question? I did. Yeah. Okay. I'm Answer sorry. his question. Yes, sir. You may. Ms. Coffin, would you give him as many stickers as he needs? Thank you, Governor, I'm going to mark for purposes of identification this next document as Defense Exhibit Number 24. You may. It is marked. D24. All right. They've given me a sign there that the jurors have heard enough for tonight. I'm going to send them home. As I said, I was going to go as long as until you want to go home. You ready to go? You told me you want to go. Deputy Garrett, if you can get in position. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave your notes uh, in the jury box. Let me get in the jury box. Let me give you these instructions. Do not discuss the case. I'll allow anyone to discuss the case with you. We'll pick up at this point tomorrow where we end it tonight. Do not remain upon the floor. I don't want you to interact with anyone you should not interact with. Do not read or look at any media coverage pertaining to this case. Do not go upon the internet and do any research about this case. Do not blog about this case while it's ongoing. Do not go to any location that may have been made reference to. Or uh, all the evidence must come to you in the form of sworn testimony and all evidence that's introduced during the course of the proceeding. You're more than welcome to bring something to drink and our snack with you tomorrow. Do not consume any alcoholic beverages during lunch. Uh, Deputy Garrett will provide you with your communication devices, but you cannot have those in the jury room. Uh, just make sure when you come back tomorrow, put them in the off position so they will not be vibrating throughout the day. The lawyers and parties cannot talk and interact with you. I don't ever want you to think they're being rude or discourteous. All right? We're going to reassemble tomorrow morning at, um, at 9 o'clock. And at this point in time, we're in recess till 9. All right. <laughs> It is 11 Alive's continuing coverage of the trial of Andrea Snyderman, a very, very long day three on this Wednesday. Court wrapping up at 5.30. It began at 9 a.m. this morning. I'm Jeff Hollinger along with Will Smith, and it has been uh, a day really in two parts. The morning session was establishing a timeline of when Andrea Snyderman knew about the death of her husband, Rusty, and when she was revealing it. Don Snyderman was uh, uh, the first witness on the stand today, and... You really got a, a sense of, of uh, rancor between he and his former daughter-in-law. You really got a sense of how different they seem to see how all of this has played out. And I think it was a, a strong beginning for the state, too, because the um, discrepancies in the timeline, when she called uh, Don and, and told him that his son had been shot or if she had actually said he had been shot, uh, really reflected poorly upon her story. But then um, the bitterness between Don and uh, Mrs. Snyderman, I think, kind of lent itself more towards the defense. Um, definitely showed that he had a bias that started before any of the incident with uh, Hemi Newman. Well, the afternoon has been very long, very tedious, very arduous in that they have been playing the first interview between uh, the Dunwoody detective, Andrew Thompson, and Andrea Snyderman inside the home of Andrea and Rusty. And in attendance, you can hear the children in the background as well as the parents of Andrea Snyderman who were also sitting in the midst of this. And I guess the, the question that I have for you is, how does this play for the jury? I mean, what, what, what is the sense of playing all of this out? Is it to try and show that maybe the police work wasn't as good or as specific as it needed to be? Or is it simply a case of going on record? I, I think.